Eighty percent. I hope that everybody is doing well. I hope that you enjoyed your lunch. I hope that everybody is comfortable and is mindful that the session is being recorded. So please keep your secrets to yourself at the moment before before we live stream them. Uh, we are not live streaming actually, but we're going to be uploading the recording of the session. So uh, engage. Make sure that uh, you participate in this conversation because what we're touching upon is really the trade policy issues and trade policy's role in support of climate change adaptation and resilient development. We all know how important climate change mitigation is. We know that COP after COP after COP, the message has been driven very clearly that every nation must do their share in order to reach Paris agreements. And unfortunately, until the last COP, we really saw the conversation on climate change adaptation lagging. And it's, this creates this feeling of injustice, to, especially to the developing countries who have historically not contributed big time to the, to the global emissions, yet are being demanded to contribute to their mitigation right now and with the urgency that the climate is pressing. However, we, we need not forget that climate change is an existential challenge to many of us. But in particular, the small, small island developing countries, the countries in Caribbean countries in the Pacific. We know that every country has a different challenge ahead of them. IAS is a home of global net, uh, network for national adaptation plans, and we're helping countries prepare their and implement their national adaptation plan. That's why we know that adaptation challenges are individual. Each country will have their own domestic set of priorities, depending on many issues, economical structure, the ge geographic location, even the social structure of, of, of its people. Yet having said that, we believe that trade policy must find a better way to really support those members, just like trade policy is engaging now into the discussions on uh, common approaches towards climate change mitigation and surrounding the instrument work. With this, I'll be opening up uh, the session with excellent panelists that are joining us today, and with uh, an apology from Ambassador Maria Palamaka, who has been called by her duties in the negotiations. Uh, however, I, I really have excellent speakers to present to you. Among other people uh, in this room, we have Monica Rubiolo, who is Head of Trade Promotion at the Swiss State Secretary for Economic Affairs, who leads SECO's efforts to foster socially responsible, environmentally friendly, inclusive, and sustainable trade in developing countries. <coughs> Ms. Rubiolo obtained her PhD from the University of Tübingen, Germany, and has published extensively on economic development related issues. On my left here is Jan Hoffman with double N, um, who is the chief of Amstad's <laughs> trade logistics branch. And uh, he has not only co-authored and coordinated uh, the annual Amstad review of maritime transport, but also initiated Amstad maritime country profiles, his annual liner shipping connectivity index overseer. Um, Jan is an amazing, extensive experience working at uh, United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean in Santiago de Chile at the Inter International Maritime Organization. And as his resume says, he has spent part of his life as assistant professor, import export agent, seafarer, translator, and consultant. So all of these will come, will come to, to, to support our discussions here. The last person who will uh, be speaking or uh, agricultural challenges today, is our trade policy analyst Facundo Calvo, who really has been doing a lot of research of agricultural re resilience issues and, and writing a lot of that. Facundo has excellent diplomatic background. He has been a member of a permanent mission in Argentina, in Geneva, and is at home both at research community and at the diplomatic receptions. With this, uh, I have already mentioned a little bit about, about the issues that de developing countries are, uh, are, are facing. We know how different they are. We know that sometimes those problems are regional level, sometimes they're individual level. And sometimes the problems really overlap from developing to developed countries. We have 
similar set of uh, issues that we're facing with. I know that Jan later will be talking a little, a little bit about maritime challenges and Fukunda will be speaking about the resilient agriculture. But Monica, can you give us a glimpse of how the cooperation work, how develop and developing countries can work together on this common set of issues? How can we look into the priorities? What, is, what are the Swiss examples on that? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much uh, also for the opportunity to contribute to the discussion here. And I think that the, the, uh, the challenges you are making between these two agendas, which are not too different, uh, the mitigation and, and the adaptation agenda are, are clearly extremely important. And uh, what the cooperation can do about it is really starting, first of all, with increasing the awareness of the linkages between the two. So these are not two separated agendas. Um, and uh, it's not only about uh, coping with the impact on specific economies, specific regions, specific sectors, but it's really to have a little bit of foresight and, and prevention in terms of what the changing climate patterns are, are, are imposing on the economies. And it's not only the economies in, in developing countries, it's also the economies in industrialized countries. And I think all around, the people around the table are more experts than me on the topic, but you know, we are talking about uh, the different, the changing trade partners, we have patterns, we are talking about the impact in various ecosystems, uh, in particular maritime and coastals, which means that important sector for generating employment and trade and growth at the end, like agriculture and tourism and fisheries too, will be impacted. And this is clearly one big problem. The development cooperation has in fact, in particular the Swiss one, has been working on, on these issues for ta some time, but we are kind of changing the angle uh, <coughs> increasingly. The third thing that, uh, that, is, uh, that is important um, and we are trying to tackle is how to strengthen the capacity of the countries to plan in advance, to anticipate whatever the changes are in terms of, for instance, urban development and, and managing the big cities, which are uh, the, the ones that are, will be suffering, but also the smaller ones. And this is in part related to uh, work on disaster risk, financing disaster risk prevention. Um, I had a chance uh, one year ago to visit uh, Indonesia, for instance, which has an incredible uh, system developed now in order to prevent floods, to manage the traffic in the cities, to, like this, also manage all what uh, CO2 emissions are. But floods, you know, what the impacts in, in countries like Indonesia and others in East Asia are, are really extremely disruptive. And it means to just cut in the countries for quite a while out of the, of, of the global value chains. So this type of work is one thing that, that we are doing uh, more and more, also collaborating with the private sector. Um, there are uh, quite efforts in the area of, uh, of uh, disaster risk insurance, where we collaborate together with uh, multilateral partners, the World Bank, but also the IMF and the regional development banks on how to prevent, how to uh, transfer the risks to the ones that can bear that risk. Um, so this is also one, one important uh, work. The other work relates more directly to agri-value chains. And uh, in this regard, we really try to support increasing the sustainability in value chains. That means increasing resilience. And just to, to talk about a couple of examples that are keeping being mentioned in the, in the other discussions, coffee and, and, and cocoa are the ones. Yes, we, we are also observing that there is a, um, a change climate pattern, which means that the production areas in these two commodities are going higher and higher. And this is what is driving also deforestation. And we are very conscious of, of that. So it is, um, our work is really concentrated on ensuring, strengthening the resilience, strengthening, uh, applying agroforestry uh, systems and deforestry diversified systems in order to ensure that the, the farmers can have different sources of income and can not only rely on, on, the, on the crops, uh, but when they rely on the crops also that there is an increased price that uh, they are getting through fair prices, through additional um, uh, prices that they, they can get and through reforming also the systems. Because 
In some of these cases, it's, uh, we need also to talk about the governance in the systems on how the prices are set, are set in the origin countries. And uh, last but not least, the other area where we are working is also at the macro uh, area. So uh, some of the colleagues in the other in the other room were talking about uh, debt management and uh, the, uh, the the increasing uh, levels of debt in many countries, but also about the awareness in in the budget process on environmental issues mm -hmm. and how do you integrate in the macroeconomic planning and in increasing the fiscal space of the countries, uh, the environmental and climate related issues. And this is also a work that uh, has just started, so it's, it's perhaps the, the newest one where we see uh, the opportunities to integrate uh, different instruments to, to ensure that also um, the, the payment for uh, uh, environmental services, for instance, are uh, becoming part of the budgeting process in the government. So this is extremely important in, in our view. So I will stop here and then we can continue. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and, and thank you so much for reminding us all the, all the diverse uh, range of trade policy instrument and trade related cooperation opportunities. I think mm -hmm. a lot of people, when they think about developing countries and their challenges, they, they they raise the issue of access to finance and debt management more and more, especially trying to mitigate the costs that were already incurred by the climate change management. Um, I will stop a little bit. I, I, I have one question I really want to ask Monica, but I will look across the room to give the floor to whoever would want to ask first. I'm really sorry to be just trying to get into this. Yeah. Yeah, sir? Yeah. Uh, could, would you, would you, would you my, my name is uh, Fernando Zidola yes. from East Timor, a small island that, uh, mm -hmm. nearby Indonesia. Before we were we part of Indonesia, but we, get our, uh, we got our independence in 1999. We are a very young country. I'm really interested with what you have uh, uh, commented on. on uh, uh, issues and how to uh, uh, how to overcome with uh, with uh, um, more uh, integrated work in, a, in, a, in, the, in the ground especially for uh, for coffee coffee uh, industry issue mm -hmm. our economy rely on coffee industry this time we change, uh, we, we face a, a, a big challenge. We, we rely on 90% Arabica coffee, but climate change is really impacting our, our coffee industry. So we would like to we would like to uh, change a little bit in how we can introduce uh, robusta because because the tolerance for Arabica is 23 degrees. Above I mean, twenty three degrees. Mm -hmm. Previously, we still can 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 harvest arabica on eight eight hundred meters above sea level, but this time very hard for people in this area. So in two thousand and ten, it was it was a big meeting in Bali. All expert in coffee area really want to come up with a, a breeding program. To find a new variety that can cope with the, with the, with climate change, but until now, there is uh, no result from from the effort. So therefore, we welcome if if you have any any program, you can choose Timor Leste as a as a place for for to to trail the the the. I mean, uh, uh, in terms of macroeconomy. Mm -hmm. Microeconomy, <laughs> environmental, and food security. We welcome you. Okay. Thank you. This is an excellent outline of the problem. Uh, but but, but <laughs> one, 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 one more thing. It's not. Uh, I, I just want to. Uh, I just want to give you real things that we are facing, because we all we all concern on 
on, on agricultural value chain. We really want to come up with, uh, with, uh, with uh, offensive agricultural development value chain. But what we face in the, in the field until now, there, there is a, a um, funding aid that huge aid come through WTO. WTO. But, uh, but uh, um, what, we, what we would like to see in the future, why don't this, this aid facilitate the certified body? So to not give, uh, give uh, I mean, that the value uh, is, uh, we, we would like to see value add uh, to poor people. Because sometimes certifying body like uh, NASA, we work with the NASA Australian, Australian Organic, and then we work with uh, uh, New Zealand uh, Fair Trade, and, uh, and, uh, but, but it's very, very expensive. Therefore, why we don't see this funding just to, to uh, facilitate certi certification that is not uh, very expensive for, for people, for, for mm -hmm. people. Then we will see the result of value add to poor people. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. Monica, do you think there is some experiences that you can already share that are a bit <coughs> comparable? There was a conversation a lot about the partnerships, and I think you, you spoke about your partnerships with uh, uh, private sector and banks. What do you think could be pathways there? What is important to think about when, when you think about such situations like Timor-Leste? And we'll probably go back to the agriculture issue with Facundo later on. Okay, just just one reflection on that. You know that uh, Switzerland is, is well known uh, for its uh, consensus-oriented culture. So we, we live in a country with different uh, linguistic uh, uh, regions, with different mentalities also behind that. And we are really very used, and I can tell you this is the, the way how the Swiss administration thinks is really to reach consensus. And this is the reason also why we have embarked in a number of uh, consensus-oriented multi-stakeholder partnerships. Uh, so we have launched one on the, in the COHOA sector and we are about, I hope this will happen in, my, uh, in May, June, a multi-stakeholder partnership in the coffee sector, which is uh, to be called the Swiss uh, Sustainable Coffee Initiative. And there we will be partnering with the private sector with the NGO community, with the certifications community, um, and uh, with the producers, with the roasters, and we are thinking about how to engage also in dialogue with the origin countries. And the idea will be to have a co-financing mechanism that allows the private sector to partner with the, uh, partners in, in the origin countries, even in the regions that are not strictly speaking, the priority countries of the Swiss cooperation. So I do not exclude, I cannot promise anything, but I do not exclude that we may become active in countries like, like Timor, really. This is one thing, and, uh, and I think that in terms of reducing the cost of certification, this speaks to my heart because it's one of the areas where we work. We have a, a standing collaboration uh, with ISIL, which is the, uh, the agency uh, responsible, let's say, for the, all the certification organizations. We collaborate also with the IASD on, in this. And one of the issues we want to tackle is interconnectivity between the systems in order to reduce the certification costs. So this is, this is really one, one important thing. Lieva, if you allow me just one, uh, one mention on, on, on the points, the links between this agenda and the, the trade negotiations agenda. Absolutely. And this is, to me, the, the, there are two areas where really developing countries could do more in order to have more benefits. And this is engaging in the discussions. You have the structure, the, the trade and environmental sustainability uh, structure discussions where we want to advance really the, the conversations around how, how to support sustainability in the developing countries and LDCs. And this is one, one area, one uh, platform where developing countries can engage. And we also hope that in the next time, the committee, um, uh, the CTA on, on, on trade and environment can <coughs> become more energized and um, Switzerland hopefully will be taking a leading role there and we, we really are looking forward for 
the Balkan countries to engage there. That's if our pledge. Remember, remember Timor Leste. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monica. Uh, with this. I think we will be segueing to a more sectoral part of this discussion. And, and I think, though agriculture has been mentioned, let's, let's start with the maritime sec sector that is really a lifeline of so many economies. Not only it's enabling trade, and we're all thinking of ours about those big shipping containers, but it also enables the production in so many distant islands. So it, it's really connecting us all. Monica already mentioned the importance of maritime transport, so I'll just ask you to take us away and, and, and tell us about both challenges, but also maybe pathways forward on this. And I know that we will also be able to, uh, to see some of the beautiful images from your collection. Thank you. No, thank you, Yeva, and thank you, ISD, for putting this together. Yes, it, it's true, maritime transport really moves 80% of, of volume of, of trade. And the sector itself is also a fascinating sector like trade in services and, and to produce a maritime service you have a ship owner from Greece, a ship built in Korea, the seafarers from Philippines, in short in the UK and, and the flag of Liberia and it's, it's a globalized production which is governed by a global body. So in that sense a lot of the things we are working on and trying to achieve with a yeah, global problem like climate change, and, and there's actually an opportunity with the global organization, the International Maritime Organization. I work for ANCTA, but we collaborate with the IMO. I used to work for the IMO, so it's close to my heart. So if I look at emissions from maritime transport, and then I will make the linkage also to adaptation, but emissions from maritime transport have actually increased by 20% over the last 10 years. This came out of our most recent annual report. And we were a bit surprised because there's a lot of effort going on to reduce emissions from shipping, but in reality they were still going up. And this was the, the chart that was most quoted in the press from our report. Now that's the bad news. The good news is trade has actually grown even more. And overall I think that's a good thing, working on trade and development. So as trade has grown even more, one can also show that the emissions per ton of cargo per container have been going down. That's the good news. Now, I'm sorry I have to spoil that good news too, because half of that improvement is only due to economies of scale, of ships getting bigger and bigger, which in turn is a challenge for the smaller and more vulnerable, who cannot accommodate these ships in their climate change <coughs> adaptation, in their ports. No? So here, yeah, we had discussed and you had kindly said, let, let's, let's share some, some impressions of what, what happens actually at, at the coast. We did test it before and it did I work. That's oh, yes, no. coming. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this is uh, different photos from Hoffman's travels uh, that I think shows, uh, <laughs> show, <laughs> shows uh, the vulnerability here, for example, on the Comoros. No? <clears throat> Uh, this one is on the Marshall Islands. You see the children playing there, but you also, s I think we can perceive the vulnerability. Here you see clearly something happened already with, with weather. Uh, still on the Marshall Islands here. This is Micronesia. Um, here you see how, uh, how few ships, that's a small ship, every few weeks ships arrive. Uh, vulnerability also in terms of connectivity, of having access to trade, to goods, very large dependency. This is uh, Easter Islands, which are like the signposts to all corners of the world. Um, Sao Tome, I think, I mean, maybe a nice photo, or this one, maybe a beautiful photo, but uh, it also, I think, shows the, this vulnerability um, still, Sao Tome. Here, why do these containers come on these ships? Because the big ships, cannot actually reach the port, they have to anchor outside and then connect with barges. Very, very difficult logistics, very expensive uh, trade logistics. No? Um, Li Liberia, which is actually now the biggest flag, uh, the, the largest share of tonnage and shipping is flying the flag of Liberia. Here you have the coast, which is also vulnerable. This, I believe, is Djibouti, Comoros, the, the 
part of the time this this is the port of one of the islands. So you see how how vulnerable the port infrastructure is, and also how how dependent on shipping connectivity. This is all still Comoros, also here ship recycling on an island, um, and I think I had some. This is still Comoros. This is in Chad, not the coast, but but also there was a flooding. There were people displaced from from floods. Uh, Maldives. Uh, here you see um, there's land recovered. You see in the back they put sand, but the land is created by filling up a coral reef with garbage. Yeah, then it is burned, then you put sand on top of it. And the sand is imported by Bangladeshi workers from India. Yeah. Um, and the highest point on, say, Marsha Islands or Maldives is one and a half or two meters above sea levels. Are they worried about climate change and the rising sea levels and storms? Yes, that's why they put up these things uh, to protect their children. No? Um, Philippines, protecting from potential tsunamis and so on. That's the last photo I'd like to illustrate the partnership. So now, uh, linking this now to, to adaptation, how, how do we see this linkage between mitigation, like we have to reduce emissions, and how do we see this also as an opportunity? And it was mentioned here earlier in many other industries, you, you can say, okay, I have a cement factory in Bujumbura, or I have a brewery in Ouagadougou, or maybe the other way around. Um, and, and I say, okay, look, it's not your fault, climate change. If, if you need to reduce emissions, it costs you much more, and you are more, more vulnerable, so I give you more time. This does not work in shipping. I cannot say, oh, I'm flying the flag of Liberia, uh, I'm being given more time. <laughs> in shipping, it, there's realistically no way but to give the same obligations to everybody. <coughs> Unfortunately, because normally, we, I think we argue, sorry, those who it was not their fault, it's more difficult for them, they don't contribute that much, I give them more time, and so on. doesn't work in shipping. But then the beauty of, of shipping is there is this global regulatory scheme and there are, as we speak, negotiations ongoing. We at Angta, we support these negotiations through impact assessments. Um, and one of the proposals is a so-called economic measure. It used to be called market-based measure. Or um, if, if I now say it could be a tax, please delete this from the recording because we are not allowed to call it a tax. Yeah? But call it a levy, call it something else. But there is a real opportunity to make alternative fuels more competitive by putting up the price for traditional fuels. Basically, internalization of externalities, polluter pays. And these funds that are then generated through this can be used to invest and help with uh, investing in alternative fuels, in, uh, making developing countries sit um, also providers of alternative fuels, it's really money that can be invested, but it can and should also, in, in our ANCTA view, then also be invested in climate change adaptation. So here's the linkage between showing the vulnerabilities, showing the beautiful global complexities of maritime transport, but also the opportunity that through an um, economic measure to, uh, to improve mitigation, generate funds that would help us with adaptation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jan. So much, Jan. And, and really, when you think about it, and I, I think that <coughs> stems from our earlier discussions, mm -hmm. it's striking that while we are repeating so often the phrase that it needs to be the polluter that pays, it's now mostly the victims and most vulnerable yeah. countries that are not really getting the extension or extra time to fix their vulnerabilities, but rather they are on the receiving end. It's, it's them who now invest so heavily into their infrastructure, yeah. just not to be completely wiped out. Um, with this, would anybody interested in asking a question about maritime? logistics. Let me then try to, try to ask you, um, in terms of regional approach, where do you think those vulnerabilities are 
showing up mostly. We mm. all presume that, of course, those are small island developing yeah. states, but are there particular coastal lines which which are also so so fragile? Um, it's from previous impact assessments we have done, and I don't want to prejudge the next round we are working on, but but clearly there are especially countries in the Pacific, the Pacific Islands, who are most negatively affected potentially if shipping costs go up, because that is something, thanks for the question. <laughs> uh, yes, we, we are in favor of, of reducing emissions, and this has <coughs> cost. There's no way to negate that uh, alternative fuels are more expensive. They are less energy dense, and, and there's a real danger that countries that are very small in volume and trade volume and are very far away, already today they have difficulties to provide bunkering fuel for the return journey. So a ship goes a long way to some small island in Kiribati, <coughs> and if it's lucky, it gets return bunker fuel. If in future, the same small island has to provide ammonia and hydrogen and green methanol and traditional fuels, it, it may fall off the cliff. So, so in that sense, small islands, which small volumes and far away, they are double in danger of being affected by climate change. And that we know, you know the, the rising sea levels, different weather patterns and, and so on, but also by the risk of, of increasing transport costs and lower shipping connectivity. So that is clearly a... Yeah, some, of course, some coastal and least developed countries, but I would say especially SITs are, are most negatively affected by both, by the cost of mitigation and by the need for adaptation. If you'll allow me to use mm. that very cruel pun, the logistical <laughs> deserts, if, yeah. if you yeah. might, it's, yeah. it's, 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 a, it's a horrible perspective. Please, Monica. Just leave it. One, one question that I was wondering. Um, uh, you were mentioning the problem of uh, connectivity, induced problems because of the, of the uh, inability for the ports mm. to, to receive mm. the bigger shifts. And, and one thing that I, I was wondering is why there are no more linkages to regional actions in that mm. regard. Um, I mean, we have the AFT, FTA in the case mm. of of, uh, of Africa, and, but there are not really discussions about mm. you know regionalizing the efforts in terms of, of shipping, which could in turn yeah. also support the better connectivity uh, at the country level uh, internally. Yeah. And when you compare, I mean, just just uh, if you see what what Morocco is trying to do in the Mediterranean, where they want to play a regional role and they are trying to connect. Uh, by this way, Tunisia, Egypt, and, and uh, even Algeria and, and others in, in the North African region. Why is there not, not more of, of that regionalization of, uh, of effort? I'll, 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 did you want to ask a question? Yeah, please. Then I, if, yeah, yeah. If, if, if you might, yeah, we, we will just co combine those two. Yes, okay. Please introduce yourself. <clears throat> so, my name is Nick Oldenburg. Um, I have a question particularly on how do you, what is your view on how corporations or like the private sector um, so how, how do you see, for example, Marsk, maybe my pronunciation is a little bit off, but how do you see like Marsk, for example, like a multinational um, playing a role into this? Like, okay. Please go ahead. I think Any other I think questions? we're covered for a moment. Yeah, yeah in terms of solutions in this, uh, and I think in both we are talking now more about the, the mitigation of the way. You know, how, how do we do this energy transition, which is the, the biggest challenge in, in shipping, if I can introduce my answer with a general comment there. The previous energy transitions in transport, and I think we can apply it to other industries, but in transport, the previous energy transitions were from, from walking to using the wheel, or from um, rowing to the wind, or from wind to coal, from coal to oil. And they were all somehow self-funded because the new technology was more efficient and the private sector invested. The next energy transition should also be self-funding if the private sector has to pay for the total cost. Now we are back to my polluter pays principle. So Maersk in particular is, um, is actually quite proactive in that area. They would like to be a, a first mover um, and 
hoping, preempting future regulations. No? In that sense, uh, I think it makes a business case to, to invest early on in alternative fuels so that when the regulation comes, <coughs> the, the bigger companies, and that's something we also have to admit, uh, as a provider, it is actually more the larger and stronger and maybe from richer countries companies that are more likely to be able to cope with this. No? Then we come back to the ideal solution. Can we somehow support regional smaller providers to also connect? Um, and it's very, very difficult. Sometimes the, the medicine is worse than the, than the illness because if you try to to protect, like through cabotage restrictions or through other uh, regional protection schemes, then it may be, yeah, you may protect national providers, but they may not be the most efficient ones. So there's a, unfortunately a, a trade-off again, um, where the uh, could tell some anecdotes, but this is being recorded. I would have to name company names, but uh, <laughs> uh, but there are certainly cases where you say actually the the real strong and big players. They are positive, supportive of the good thing of, of reducing emissions, but they also know that that gives them um, an advantage, a market advantage, vis a vis smaller and weaker regional players. I see. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jan. Uh, Tatiana, can, can, can we try to see if we still have time at, at the end of the session? And, and then we might, we might come back to you to, for discussion. But before we, we get to that part, we have Facunda, who will probably roll back to the issues raised by, by the state of gentlemen from Timor Leste, uh, as well as, as by Monica speaking about big challenges in the sector of agriculture the innovation that is demanded there, and, and really food security challenges that are coming with, with disasters. Could you, could you present us a little bit of your thinking and your research around the topic? Sure. Um, I, I have an argument that I want to put forward here, and the argument is as follows. Trade could, could play a key role in climate change uh, adaptation, or adaptation to, to, to climate change. And sound trade, sound trade policies, the right, the right uh, trade policies. Uh, but first, before talking about that, I think it's very important to highlight what, what everyone knows, that climate change is already having a neg very negative impact, harmful impact on a specific uh, countries. And what I want to uh, underline also is that that impact is uneven. It's not equal. When it comes to agriculture, we have, uh, I would say, two sets of countries. We have the countries that are very close to the equator, the low latitude countries, we can say, and some countries in, in, in the Pacific. I can, say, I can think also of, for example, of Timor-Leste and, and, and many other um, examples, which are particularly vulnerable to, um, to, to climate change. It's not something that is also in the modeling and, and in some studies, but it's also part of, 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 of our present. And then we have the I would say the higher latitude countries, those that are closer to, to the poles, that will or might eventually benefit from, let's say, um, higher temperatures. Because some areas, I can think areas in maybe Russia or in Canada that are not arable, that are not apt for agriculture right now, they will benefit. So maybe a first key takeaway that I want to, uh, to take from that is that um, and I want to use Monica the expression that uh, um, the taken expression um, that you, you mentioned during your presentation: change of climate, change patterns. In the context of climate change patterns, we will have a new geo geo geopolitics of food. The geopolitics of food will be different. The trade patterns will be different. Who produces what will change. In this context, trade will become essential for a very simple reason. Those areas that will be most affected and are affected right now at this moment need trade, rely on trade to get the food uh, they, they need. So at a very basic level, I would like to say that global markets, open markets with good rules, and then we can move, all, move on to the issue of rules because we are speaking in the context of the MC13 and um, of the WHO Ministerial Conference, we need rules to support uh, these uh, efforts in, clim uh, in, in, in adaptation to, 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 to climate change. So, more food from areas of surplus, 
to areas of deficit. This is the very first um, message that I want to convey um, today. And I think that the issue of vulnerability, I think we, we always use uh, also in my mother tongue in Spanish, the expression, one image speaks more than 1,000 words. And the, and the images that you were uh, showing, uh, Jan, I think that um, w w when I was looking at, at, uh, at, at, at the shipping arriving, maybe, uh, we don't know, every one, two weeks, sometimes even more, shows how dependent those countries are, um, uh, and, and specifically in many emerging economies and LDCs are uh, on international trade. Not only for food, because here I'm focusing my presentation on food security, but we can be speaking of medical equipment as well. We can be uh, speaking about um, any other essential um, um, input that, 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 that we need for, 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 for the daily life. So trade plays a, a key role there. Um, and then we have um, what the FAO calls uh, the weather-induced production shortfalls. That uh, I can think of, I, I will take the example of, 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 of your country, of Timor-Leste, if you allow me to, to do that. You say that, um, that uh, coffee uh, production is quite important. We can imagine what would happen if uh, there is an event in which part of the production is uh, basically um, affected by that. We will need to um, eventually rely um, uh, on, on trade or to look for ways of diversifying. This is the second part that I want to focus on my presentation in the sense that I want to say trade is not the, the silver bullet, it's not the panacea that will allow us to solve all the issues. There are also things that we can do uh, domestically, for example, diversifying crop, produ crop, uh, crop production, that is something that you were saying. What we can do, for example, uh, internally is to, uh, and, and this is part, this is, if we, if we look again, I'm going back to the WTO, to what is being discussed right now on domestic support, let me tell you that the current rules of the WTO agriculture agreement on domestic support allow you to provide support to the so-called general services, for example, extension services for farmers to train them in the use of certain technologies, and this is not uh, problematic, this is not uh, within the so-called category of trade distorting domestic support. So I think that there are a lot of things that we can do, both on trade, from international trade, but also at the domestic uh, level to, um, uh, to, to, to foster this um, climate adaptation um, efforts. I have been focusing, I think, uh, on trade, uh, on the positive uh, things, but of course, uh, I think we have to be very uh, much aware of some of the drawbacks that I think that the presentation uh, Jan uh, touched upon, uh, of course, the, the issue of, of, of shipping emissions, um, then the connectivity issues. Uh, the, 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 this is, of course, maybe the, one of the major drawbacks, and, and when we talk about trade, this always comes to, to the discussion. Uh, it's unavoidable, I would say. And I also want to focus on, um, especially because we are in the context of, of a ministerial conference, I want to focus on uh, trade policies that will not support will not so be supportive, uh, I'm trying to follow as much as possible the, the title of, of our session, trade policy in support of climate change adaptation efforts. Which, so my question, I was wondering, which are those trade policies that are not supportive of these efforts? Well, there is a very interesting um, uh, article uh, published by, by Oxfam, uh, like, I think it was like 12 or 13 years ago, in which they showcase, they say the following, what I have been saying, climate change has uh, and a, a harmful impact on our agricultural crops and yields. This is a problem. On the top of this problem, what you have is um, not very wise trade policies. And I mentioned the example of export restrictions. Export restri and the argument is as follows. Export restrictions and export ban bans can exacerbate the already negative impacts of climate change on agricultural crops uh, and yields. What we, what we see is that every time, and we, we have witnessed this in 2008, 2000, um, uh, <laughs> in, in, uh, after, after the war in, in, in Ukraine, and especially, I think that the, the, the peak was uh, around May 2022, what we saw is that prices start to increase. And, and large exporters, what they do is to resort to measures that are basically very trade restrictive, and this puts uh, further pressure on prices and increases price uh, volatility. And this is quite harmful for many emerging economies, for many LDCs who rely, again, on international markets to get the food 
the seeds and the fertilizers they need um, uh, for, for, for their, uh, to feed their, their crops and their agricultural production. So, um, all in all, what I want to say is that, um, and especially thinking of, of, of what WHO members can do and which are the right trade policies that we can choose, I think that uh, the WTO has a key re a role to play in ensuring that markets remain as open as possible, as transparent as possible. Mm -hmm. And let me show, let me conclude with a uh, with highlight something that was is already part of, 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 of what the WTO has already done. That is the MC12 Food Security Declaration. You may recall there, there is, like, I think it was in paragraph four of that declaration, in which they mention the importance of keeping uh, markets open and if you are going to impose a trade restricting measure, that measure should be, the, the implementation should be transparent, should be, of course, should be according to rule, and something very important that I think sometimes we tend to forget should be temporary. Sometimes what is temporary is not that temporary, and this, again, exacerbates the already negative impacts of climate change on um, our agricultural crops and yields. Thank you so much. Thank you, Facundo. It's, it's really fascinating how those two topics link to each other and, and really show the, how vulnerable you can become if you're just staying a little bit further away from, from major shipping routes and just a bit further away from global value chains. With this, let me have a look on whether somebody would want to pose a question to Facundo. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, please, please introduce yourself, if you could. Oh, it's Epsilon Adam. I'm a consultant in ESG. I have a question for you. Um, let's take um, Estimor as a case in a point from which we can learn, because these kind of troubles or problems that they have are not really unique for them in terms of having uh, an industry that relies uh, effectively on 70%, for example, on their coffee crops, etc. And uh, you mentioned that, in fact, um, you see that the new rules are going to support them in a way to mitigate it, the troubles that they have, if I understood you correct. And um, my question is, um, it seems like I, if I were to be in their position, I might think about diversification of my industries. That is, I won't be dependent only on one uh, kind of industry, say coffee, for example. Then the question is, if they will be so courageous as to move from agriculture, for example, to high tech, and so on. Would you be so kind, in terms of your support, to allow them, to enable them to have a better, uh, say, human capital in terms of literacy and so on, to help them in education, not only in the agricultural business, but also to offer them the options to maybe find a new value, say, for example, in software, in AI, in uh, Etc. or in commerce, you know, just to improve the literacy because it goes hand in hand that the country's literacy is, is, is in fact, is one of the uh, uh, stones that stops them from moving on. So, do you have it on your agenda that, uh, in fact, diversification of the industry, um, in fact, needs some support to create a, another? Do you have, so? I, For, I, I fully agree with your point, and I want to mention some work that IEC has been doing in that regard. Uh, we have produced, uh, you, you may know, the Ceres 2030 report, and one of the key findings of that um, uh, of, of that report uh, was that we need more uh, investment in agriculture in uh, emerging economies, uh, mainly um, LDCs. Um, this is the first part. Also, to nuance a little bit what I was saying before about in, 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 in international trade, in the sense that both uh, are important. But I think that your question uh, goes also to think beyond the agricultural sector. And I think that uh, you are totally right in the sense that when we discuss food security, it's not only about increasing uh, agricultural productivity and, and producing food more sustainably, but also Food security, uh, if we think of the four dimensions of food, uh, food security, for example, the second dimension is uh, access, the links to the economic access. And at the end of the day, um, to put it in very rough and simple terms, uh, that this has a lot to do with many other factors that go well beyond agriculture. Uh, the, basically, the income that people have to uh, purchase the, the, the food they need. 
So um, I think that uh, in that regard, I always try to, to, to emphasize that trade is just one part, one small part, but also if not properly managed, could be, could be part of the problem and not of the solution. But I definitely subscribe the fact that maybe um, may, most countries, if you look at pre past examples, they have solved many of the food security issues they had by becoming more service oriented and, 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 and less focused on an activity that we know that is difficult, not only because of the, we of the weather, but also because even if you look at Euro, in Europe, we don't have to, um, uh, to, to, to only focus on, 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 on small countries. The issue of, of, of incomes, of farmers' incomes, uh, that I think is something that w was mentioned in, in, in the discussion, is, 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 is one of the big challenges. So definitely, yes, I fully subscribe to your, your so would comment. you offer them support, is my question. Yes. The bottom line is, would you offer them support? Yes, and, and, what I, what, what, and, and what I was trying to make the link when it comes to support is that the WTO rules allows you to offer that support, and this support cannot be challenged uh, or, or conte contested. Because there is, I, I don't want to enter into details, but there is uh, something called the Green Box, that is Annex 2 of the Agreement on Agriculture, that is, uh, and then you have a, a, a subsection that is on general services. And there you have everything. You have many of the things that I think you are pointing at. You have infrastructure. You have uh, training, agricultural extension services. And all this is considered good or positive. Thank you. Also in the sense, because this doesn't link to production. You will not incentivize uh, farmers to produce more uh, with that. You will just, uh, in the short term, of course, because you can yeah. also say that if you increase agricultural productivity and farmers are better educated, eventually, yes. in the long term, this will link to production. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you very much. I saw question here. Could yes. you introduce yourself for everyone? Mm -hmm. sure. I'm uh, Yasmin Ismail, uh, Senior Policy Advisor at uh, the Forum on uh, Trade, Environment and SDGs. I have a question for Jan uh, <coughs> about the, um, the maritime transport. My question, because you've put it very well that, yeah, investing in, um, in alternative fuels will bring its benefits from adaptation. But my question is, what's the time span for this investment? Because I don't think that these countries have, have the luxury of time of just starting with investments in, in alternative fuels. And I think everyone knows that, I mean, we're getting there now or later. This is one of the things that countries at some point realize will have to work on. But what I want to say is, what are the measures that can be taken now in a company with, with, uh, with the investment? And I'm also interested in finding out what's really the time span for, for such an investment in order for it to bring the revenue that you're saying can fund <coughs> and support adaptation. Thanks a lot, Yasmin, for circling back to Jan, because I was about to go and ask uh, Tatiana to also introduce herself and pose a question, which I found was also directed to, to Jan. But Thank you so much, Yara. My name is Tatiana Fayosova. I'm a senior associate uh, at a law firm, Van Bell & Bellis, based uh, in Geneva. And I have a question uh, linked uh, to what you said about the opportunities uh, that uh, the shift uh, also to cleaner um, uh, maritime fuels uh, may give to the, in developing countries. And there was a question as to, you know, what is the role of the private sector in that? So if I'm not mistaken, I recall that uh, quite a few years ago there have been some initiatives in the aviation sector where IATSA members had some projects in developing countries for sustainable aviation fuels. And I was just wondering, I mean, I, I don't know exactly whether there is anything similar in the maritime sector, and so I was wondering if... You have heard about such initiatives because I understand also the situation is a bit different in the maritime sector with different stakeholders. So you have uh, ship owners and shippers uh, associations and so on and so forth. So maybe you don't have the same structure um, of the industry representation uh, at the international level, but maybe there are some initiatives within IMO or some other organizations. Uh, I was just curious. Thank you. Two questions to you, Jan. Good. Um, yeah, okay, two questions, three points answering. answering uh, I, I want to start out highlighting, not to be misunderstood, we love shipping. <laughs> shipping is the, is the most energy efficient mode of transport by far. Yeah? And um, giving uh, examples, um, 
and, and okay, I'm originally from Germany, so I, I'm allowed to give these examples. Uh, uh, like the the energy spent or the emission spent getting a bottle of wine from Chile to Hamburg is less than getting it by truck than from Hamburg to, to Berlin, by way of example. No? And Chilean wine is much better. But um, <laughs> the, or, or coal, to, to dig out coal from deep under the ground in Germany is much more energy intense than taking coal that is on the surface in South Africa and carrying it by, by ship. No? So that's that at the outset. In terms of the... The, and, and still, we do want to decarbonize it, it's clear. So, so in terms of the time scale, um, there are quite clear targets set by the IMO, International Maritime Organization, to aim at zero around 2050. And this is really quite far away. <laughs> Today, there are very, very few. Depends on how you measure, but, but less than 5%, less than 2% of ships that already use really alternative fuels. Um, the key point we are making, and, and Anktat is more the people looking at the economics of it, we need clarity, we need clear, a clear pathway and clear carbon prices, clear timescales to, to limit emissions so that the investors, including private sector, actually do this. And there, everybody is waiting for everybody else. So the ships, ship owners, investors, shipyards, banks, uh, should al already now invest in some of these more expensive few, if, if it's not yet more economical. Um, and on top of this, the ports are not yet ready to provide me with my alternative fuels. And the ports have even longer time spans in their investments. They, why would I now invest, especially in poorer, further away, in, in some providing ammonia or something like it, It's very expensive. So this is really uh, something where seed money subsidies to support a public good make a lot of sense. And that is very important that, that member states of the IMO agree on clear rules, including, I hope, on, on also clear economic measures. So I'm cannot really give you exact dates, but I hope I have given you the <coughs> aspects that answer the question. In terms of the um, question about the yeah, type of opportunities, <coughs> very, very long in the future, I think, I hope, that we will be able to convert renewable energy like power to X you know, and somehow have very low marginal cost of shipping. You will have, once you manage to, to convert solar, wind, other energy into something that can be transported on a ship as a fuel, and this costs go down, ships can go 30 knots and, and at very low cost. But during the transition, it is unfortunately still very, very costly. And the opportunities there for countries, are, it has to do with their geography, like countries that have been mentioned as potentially benefiting, include Morocco, for example, or Mexico, Chile is mentioned. Uh, so they, could, they are among the first we expect to, to do this, uh, generate uh, alternative fuels that can then be provided to the, to the shipping industry. And overall, of course, it's, I think it's positive if there's a larger number of countries can, that can do this, and not only those that have oil in the ground. With this, we have the approach to the end of our sessions. I would really be happy to listen to more of this. I won't try to conclude everything. I think we all heard that, unfortunately, climate change challenges don't walk alone. As neither should we. We hope that there will be much more cooperation on the topic between the governments, between organizations, between a think tanks such as ours. I would really like to thank our panelists on behalf of everyone, and if we can just give a little round of applause to all of us. However, we want to share the opinions. Please scan the code and let us know what we can do better next time. Thank you so much. Thank you.